guys, I'm, my name is Corey Ruth and I'm doing a little interview about with Lefty Cray about fishing Back Bay, Virginia, which is um, a really extraordinary bass fishery that we've had that has kind of come and gone. And uh, Lefty was taking advantage of it back in the day when we were catching a lot of big fish there. So I'm going to let him elaborate on that a little bit as we go along here. In the middle 1950s, uh, I lived in Maryland and two wealthy guys who were friends of mine were avid largemouth bass fishermen, as was I. And so what we, the three of us came down here and we came on a number of trips. We, we stayed on Knot Island and at, I'm almost 92 and I can't remember the name of the family, but they'd been there for generations. In fact, if you'd have threw paint at that building, it would have sucked into the board that had been there that long. Uh, but it was a wonderful family uh, and I think the most outstanding thing other than the fishing was that the breakfasts were incredible. I mean, uh, it was country ham and sausage and pancakes and biscuits and gravy and everything you shouldn't eat but you love to eat. And we came down the first time just for largemouth bass. Uh, later on, we started combining trips, usually in late October, when there were an incredible number of ducks that would actually darken the sky at times. Uh, if you know Back Bay today, it did not resemble anything like Back Bay in those days. Back Bay then was shallow. It was impossible to run an outboard motor in it because it simply had too much grass. The vegetation, the aquatic vegetation was so thick that literally you had to pole the old timers that we went with pulled around and they would look for little avenues and places and a lot of the bass that you hooked you had to go over and lift them out of the grass sometimes the bass weighed less than the grass did but it was fun and um we we i've, I've fished largemouth bass all over the United States. Uh, I fished it in California, fished it up in the Midwest, uh, fished it back in Maryland where I'm from. Um, uh, not too long ago I fished several different private ranches in Texas where nobody's allowed to go except the people who own the ranch. And we've caught bass on some lures or flies that were up to 13 pounds, but I never saw bass fishing as good as it was in Back Bay in those days. Uh, <clears throat> I'd say the average bass was two to three pound, but it was not unusual at all to catch a five, six, seven pound bass. Uh, we did mostly work with popping bugs, and the reason was streamers were just completely get entangled in the vegetation. So what the, the old timers we stayed with there, uh, they they, you stayed at their home, you ate their, you know, ate their just good old country food, and um, they had boats which both ends were pointed, somewhat like a canoe, and the reason was that they could back up or move around with that pointed ends on the boats in that grass. Grass was almost, there were places you simply couldn't push a boat through it. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen anywhere where if I remember, it was eelgrass and elodeo or something like that. Um, we did that for about seven, eight, nine years before I moved to Florida. And uh, it was as great as bass fishing as i ever seen. The way we would fish for them was we would, they'd move the boat around until they found a hole in the grass. Some of the holes were only four or five feet. Some would be eight or ten feet across. You drop the bug in it, and you just move, slowly move that bug across there, and these fish were voracious. Apparently, there was, I know there were thousands of bait fish in that grass, so it was a great habitat. I went down there some years later, it was sometime, I think, in the early 70s, with Kurt Gowdy to make one of those uh, American sportsman films. And the thing I remember about that, they shot real film in those days so they didn't shoot thousands of feet of film and then edit that they it cost they did not want to shoot 
more than seven times as much film as what they used. Um, and now we use 700 times what we use. But with, it's different from digital. Anyway, the point was that I had thrown a bug into a hole. There was a swirl underneath of the bug, but the fish never took it. So I made a back cast and had the, the camera get around on the far side of that little hole. And then when they started rolling film, we were sure we were going to get a strike. So we weren't wasting film. Well, I threw the bug back, a fish took it, the camera was rolling. I set up the hook pretty hard because I thought it was a big bass. It turned out to be a brim who I hooked, and I hooked him so fast and so hard with that 10 weight rod that he come out of the water into the air and slammed up against the side of that wooden boat and killed him dead. That was an outtake from the film, but all, everybody there rode me for days about that thing. It was such good fishing. And then there was a hurricane, I don't even remember when, but a hurricane put a lot of salt water back and it flooded the bay pretty badly. I don't know what caused that, but that was the demise of the grass. Literally in, it seemed like months, the grass almost all that disappeared. I just assumed it was a salt water killing. But I, I, don't, I don't think there's ever been any scientific studies to find out what happened or not. Regardless of that, it destroyed that fishery. It's my impression now that the state's doing some a good bit of work by restocking to bring that thing back where it was, but they're gonna have to have some of that grass in there in order to do that. It was really a paradise in those days. So what was your typical rig? I mean, your outfit, your fly rod, what was your setup for that fishery? Well, in the 50s, there was only floating lines simple leaders and fiberglass rod well not even fiberglass at first uh, we were using metal rods and uh, beryllium copper was the cutting edge rod at that part of the time but, but but Fenwick came along I guess it would be in the middle 1950s and I went to work for them they were the first company to really produce effective fiberglass rods and there was a lot of misinformation when I tried to popularize them here in the eastern United States if the company was in California people would say to me well you wait till that fiberglass rod you use it in the winter time it's going to shatter all over the place but we, the rods were not very good casting they were they 50 60 feet was as far as most people could ever cast the tackle was didn't it didn't make any difference the fish were so many fish there we had a lousy tackle and we're still catching fish. It was a paradise. I fished Treasure Lake in Cuba, what's supposed to be one of the greatest fishing lakes. I fished there when Castro Jerry a week after he took over the revolution. And Back Bay was better than Treasure Lake, which was located in the Bay of Pigs area and was an incredible bass fishery. But Back Bay really was the best largemouth bass fishing I've ever fished anywhere. Just watch out for the snakes. Yeah, I have never been anywhere. I, I, you know, I lived in Miami for 10 years and fished with Flip Pallet and those guys for, I spent hundreds of hours in airboats and wading in the Everglades and all. I have never met a, moccasin orgas, uh, moccasin snakes have got a bad attitude. They are meaner than a bad mother-in-law. I mean, they they will not get out of the way. If you're moving down with a canoe or a boat or something, and there's some clear water and a moccasin comes across, you let the moccasin, you give right way to, give to them. They'll try to crawl in a the boat. They are just flat mean. And the most amount of cotton mouse I ever saw was down that Pamlico Sound and, and Back Bay area. I've never seen more moccasins anywhere. In the 1950s, um, there were no sinking fly lines. <laughs> it was all f supposed to be floating fly lines. In order to make them float, we used to have to grease them uh, because what they did, they didn't make the way they make fly lines, modern fly lines, is they take a simple braid and they build 
a vinyl core over the top of that and shape the fly rod with the outside. Mm -hmm. So what we had was they would build the whole, the, the braid was the actual shape of the a line and a coating was taken over that. And they did not float well. And because you had so much veg, aquatic vegetation there, um, you never used knotted leaders. We didn't have no knotted, le unknotted leaders in those days. The reason being that those knots picked up so much grass mm -hmm. that uh, it didn't work. The truth of the matter is you didn't need a leader over about five feet because these bass were so unsophisticated. <laughs> and uh, when you threw a fly in one of those holes in Back Bay in the 50s, it was like rolling a wine bottle into a jail cell. I mean, something was going to grab it right away. <laughs> There weren't any sophisticated fish that examined thighs. So our, our leader setup was pretty simple. It was a 15 to 20 pound test piece of line straight off the, off the fly line, straight to the hook. And uh, you had to wrestle, don't forget when you hooked, when you hooked these bass, most of the time they dove into the grass. So you had to put a lot of pressure on them. And, most of, many of the time, you, much of the time, you were not able to get them out of the grass. The boat went to where the fish were, and if you'd have had a light tapered leader, the fish would have broke that thing off and been gone anyway. We also, uh, people used the hooks in those days had very large barbs on them. And I learned very early to compress almost all the barb down on the hook. and. Hooks were made forging the points in those days, so every hook you ever bought uh, was not sharp at all. And we learned real quick uh, that we had to sharpen those hooks if we wanted to really make a difference in them. It was a uh, it was a different world. Was there a color you preferred over any other color? Or yeah, I did eventually. I found that I tried all kind of colors, and uh, well, it's like. I don't know if you know what a jitterbug is, Corey, but it's a rock to cross water like mm -hmm. this. I had so many good bass fish tell me they had to have a, a, a Dalmatian type one with white, black and white spots, and another guy had to have a red and white one, somebody else might have. The truth of the matter, except for the black jitterbug, the belly on every jitterbug was white. <laughs> and the popping bugs, People put eyes on popping bugs. They're up on the top. Only the gospel sees the eyes. Um, I found out that what was most important was not the color of the bug, but the fact that the face of that bug was a bright color. And so all the popping bugs I ever made were had a bright yellow front on the face of them. And eventually I just painted the whole bug yellow. <clears throat> uh, I don't think, and I fish, I've caught thousands of smallmouth. I've I spent two weeks right recently, one in Maine, one over another place, on smallmouth. And they didn't. I, I do not believe color in a popping bug makes any difference whatsoever. I think it's the action of the bug. That's true in nymphs. Uh, I do believe that when you're fishing trout with nymphs, that I use darker fly nymph bodies on darker bottoms and lighter nymphs on lighter bottoms. But the truth of the matter is that uh, the better the fisherman, the fewer the flies or lures he uses. He doesn't need many lures. He doesn't, I think a half a dozen flies in most situations will do it in either freshwater or saltwater. Well, the, you know, the, the, what was the ethic as far as keeping the fish or or letting the fish go back in the days was it were the fly guys still catch and release like they are now? I mean, most of our fly fishermen are you know they want to get that fish in the water and, and be able to catch it again. Was it that same? No, it was it was kind of like the Florida Keys uh, in the nineteen fifties when I or sixties when I moved there. There were less than two dozen guides in the Florida Keys, and there were so many bone fish. The tarpon would run ten feet to take a fly. Um, we really had no idea about keep uh, releasing bait. We just threw them back. It, 
it was so many fish in the Keys and in Back Bay and in Chesapeake Bay for the stripers up in Maryland. Uh, we took what we wanted to eat, but actually I never did care much for bass as a food anyway. We, we just we just caught them and threw them back. And we really, they weren't really good to eat, at least from my opinion. And um, all our fisheries at that time were, they were so plentiful, everybody thought they people. I remember I was an outdoor writer writing columns in Maryland in the 50s. And I was a little concerned about we ought to do a better job of taking care of our smallmouth bass. But it shows the mindset of people, of fishermen in those days, whether you're using lures or fly fishing. Our fishery biologist, who was uh, one of the top smallmouth men in the country at that time, I was talking about the Potomac River and we ought to have some kind of conservation methods. This would have been in probably the late 1950s. And he told me that sport fishing could never affect the populations of a river as big as the Potomac. Well, we know now differently that that's not true. Yeah, as a, as a water quality scientist, you know, we realize that it's not just the fishermen, it's the ag, it's the, the guy putting Kim Lawn on his yard to have a green yard. It's, you know, it's just there's a lot of different things that come together. So it's definitely a human problem, though, but we... I really think, Corey, that our, uh, our bass fishing in the rivers in the Mid-Atlantic, which is in really bad shape right now. The Susquehanna, for example, has been an endangered river for years. The Potomac, where we used to catch 50, 60 bass a day, you now catch 7 or 8 or 10. I don't think those rivers are ever, the politicians are so influenced by developers, agricultural interests and so on, and not taking care of our, our water treatment plants. We're never gonna have real good bass fishing back in the rivers and like the Shenandoah, the Susquehanna, the Potomac, or the Juniata, those rivers, until they become drinking sources for our then the politician will be will be refusing or won't be as easily influenced in doing the wrong thing, which is what they're doing right now. Another thing which I've come to realize lately is that the green blue algae is one of the most important problems we have and people don't seem to understand it. The biologists in the four states where I live told me at a meeting in Annapolis and state capital last year that that blue-green algae, when it comes out in the, in the spring, uh, it dies when the water elevates, but it, it coats the whole river in uh, color, and what happens is when the water elevates towards summer, all of that green algae falls like a blanket to the bottom and suffocates the insects, the baby fish, the little bass, and this is what's happened in parts of Florida this year. Yeah. And uh, we need to, we need to take, if we take care of our water supply, we're gonna have better drinking, and at the same time, we're gonna have better fishing. Look at the chemistry of the water and what's going on with, you know, nutrients and, and, and how we call, we call them hazardous algal blooms now. It's a big deal. You know, we get the stuff that glows blue yeah. at night here, and it, it, it's pretty, but it can actually be dangerous. Um, and we're, like I said, we keep an eye on it in Virginia. I, when I see what's going on down in Florida, I'm like, you know, there we would be on top of that here yeah. in Virginia. I mean, it wouldn't, I don't think we could get to that point. Well, the entire Upper Bay, Upper, I'm sorry, Florida Bay, which is all the, of the bay inside of the Florida Keys, uh, I've fished it twice in the last year, and the whole bay is virtually a fish desert and all the grasses have got a coating on them now and um, what used to be a couple hundred million dollar resource for people that live down there is now virtually a desert. Yeah. Uh, we need to... I traveled in Europe a lot during the 50s and 60s and nothing... We do so many things in this country um, that are detrimental to our environment that would never happen in Europe. 
they learned a long time ago we don't we have a lot of people living on a small amount of land and we're going to have to take care of it for example uh, the area beside runways and airports is now productive hay fields in ball in in europe they actually plant they plant food and stuff in the ditches <laughs> to raise food to sell or use where we just let it let the weeds grow we we've lived in a land which is so bountiful that we thought nothing could ever change it we really need to make a lot of changes if we're going to survive. All right, well just uh, any closing thoughts about Back Bay? Anything you... I just hope that they could bring that thing back to somewhere where it used to be. It would, first of all, it would generate another whole new business down there and do that, that area of, of Virginia and North Carolina would profit from that mm -hmm. a lot. And it would be, it's an easy access from most of the eastern United States and for another 70 or 100 miles from the coast. It would be a, a business and a fishing paradise if they could bring it back somewhat like it was.